It's that time of year once again. A look back at WPPI 2020 in Las Vegas on Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. Thanks so much for joining me. And this time around, I'm going to do what I do every year after WPPI. The first episode right after the conference, I take a look back at how WPPI was, what I thought of it, and talk about some of the interviews that I did. And here's where I'm going to start. This was hands down the best WPPI I have been to in years and years and years. For me, it's all about the social game, and I was able to go around and meet some new friends and talk to some old friends and meet some people that are kind of both. For example, I've known Sharky James of the Petapixel podcast for a number of years, but we've never met in person. Same thing with Skip Cohen. I've known Skip Cohen for a while of Skip Cohen University. He's also along with Shamira Young, the host of a couple of different podcasts on the Photo Focus Network. And I uh, finally got to meet Skip in person. Skip introduced me to people like Aaron Holmstead, who is an amazing photographer for fashion and fine art type stuff. And uh, I was able to meet her. She also does stuff for Photo Focus. Levi Sim of Photo Focus I was able to run into. So basically meeting these people, that was a lot of fun. I also did a number of interviews. And I'm going to start there with Platypod and Platyball. Larry T., Dr. T. of, of Platypod, the inventor of Platypod and Platyball. I've spoken with Larry before, and I've known Larry for now a, probably a couple of years. He was a guest on Behind the Shot. We had a beautiful guitar photograph that he did. And I went by because they have the new Plata Ball out. The Kickstarter is going at the time of this release when you see this. But at the date this show is released, there's only three days left in the Kickstarter. So go back the Kickstarter. Trust me, you're going to be happy with it. If you don't make it in time, I still highly recommend this product. Watch the interview during the show and uh, the interview and you'll understand what I mean. I also did a number of what I'll call man on the street interviews where... I just asked somebody, hey, would you tell me what you think of WPPI? I'll kind of intersperse those throughout this show. And then Canon, Canon was extremely generous with people with me this year. So I kept going back to the Canon booth and I interviewed two Canon Explorers of Light, uh, somebody else from Canon, and then also wedding photographers Bob and Don Davis. So I'm going to start there. We're going to head to the Canon booth for an interview I did with somebody that I think is hands down one of the best photography educators out there today. So I'm excited about this one. I'm still here at WPPI, and I'm gonna be at the Canon booth for a while because I've got a number of people I wanna to talk to about some of the new gear that's out. And the young lady standing next to me, I own three of her creative live videos. A crappy light video, yes. <laughs> posing 101, I could go on and on. Uh, this is Lindsay Adler, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. It is so nice for you to come over and talk to Behind the Shot. There's so much I want to talk to you about as a Canon Explorer of Light. Yes. What's your go-to body right now? Uh, okay, so I have a kind of cheat question, uh, a cheat answer. Right now it's the EOS R and the 5D Mark IV. Man, I love the face and eye tracking. So every time I go outside with the EOS R, like that's my go-to camera. With her go-to body being the EOS R, partially because of the face and eye tracking, I was kind of curious about how she paired lenses with that EOS R. Let's check it out. So um, when you're using the R, yeah. do you have a preferred lens? Um, okay, so I bought about four or five lenses. For the most part, I'm shooting with a 24 to 105, because if you watch me shoot, I'm like running all over the place. But isn't it a great range? It's a, That's why I love it, because I can get the wide shot at the full length of the model posing, then pop in for a decent tight headshot, and it doesn't slow me down. Uh, it's still sharp and beautiful. That being said, when I want to pop in, then I'll grab the 85, because it's drool-worthy, sharp, and gorgeous. But right. 24 well, to 105s will go too. The 24 to 105s, even on the R, it's an F4. Yes, right? yep. So when you go with that 85, the background it goes just, away. It's butter. It's like liquid, it's delicious. If somebody out there is looking at an EOS R versus a standard DSLR, sure. what is it about the mirrorless that gets people hooked? Because I know yeah. three or four that are literally hooked on it. Okay, I mean, I think the biggest thing I would say is speed. It makes me faster at my job. So, for example, I'm outdoors, the face and eye tracking. Like, I'm not like, oh, crap, did I nail the eye at 1-2? Like, I know I got the eye at 1-2 or 1-4, 1-8, whatever it is. Um, but also being able to see exposure simulation. So oh. if, like, so it's going to be cloudy, the sun pops out. It, you know, normally, oh, I, f I might forget to change the settings, but I 
see it when I'm shooting mirrorless. Electronic So it's like, those are the two very basic things that just make mirrorless make my job easier. But in the end, any camera that you're choosing, it's a tool. So it's a matter of how you shoot. And those That's two things, point. I think it'll make anybody's life easier. And we're in a world now yes. where these old designs of glass that have been around forever have had to be completely rethought, re-engineered and redesigned. So you're getting glass now that just exceeds anything when we started shooting. That's for sure, for sure. No, it, I think it was, it was kind of a, I knew that things could be better because we live in the future. I know that sounds corny, but no, we do. No, it's true, so things though. do it's evolve, true. things do get yeah. better. And so it's exciting. And I think what happens is a lot of consumers, we're like, hurry up, we're waiting on you. At the same time, we're excited. So it, it's, um, it's delicious to see the changes and the effect that it has on the photography. But again, it's it's a tool, right? And so I it's, love that word. It's delicious. No, but it is. Beautiful it, images it, are delicious. Really In meeting Lindsay, there's one thing you find really quickly. Her energy and her attitude is infectious. And every time she uses the word delicious, I'm not sure if I want to go get more camera gear or go find myself a Cinnabon. But one thing I wanted to do with each and every person at the Canon booth that I spoke to, the Canon Explorers of Light and the others that I did, was find out if they had a tip, one tip that they thought would help improve your photography. I know the answer exactly is to shoot and to shoot more often. What people do is they shoot, especially in the beginning, like what pays them. But the problem is then you get stuck and you don't find new solutions. So right now, I am a crazy busy professional. And a minimum, like a minimum of two days a month, I shoot where I don't make a dime. But those two days, I'm experimenting, I'm building my portfolio, I'm trying new lighting techniques, I'm experimenting. So someone just, like just around the corner said, Lindsay, your work is getting so much better. And yeah, because I'm making a point to make it better. It's not just about sticking with what's comfortable. So shoot often, give yourself challenges. It, it made all the difference to me. Yeah, I, I, I think it, the entire thing is being okay to fail. Yes. And then you learn so much and you get better. Yeah, you're already there though, you're already good. I, I, we I, all I, aspire. Wasn't always, but well, I take, I'll take the compliment. There you go. For you looking at somebody that had never been to WPPI that is a photographer, what's the reason they should come? I think the reason you should come is because you don't know what you don't know, and when you get here, you are just bombarded with tons of information, and then you can figure out what you're passionate about, what you want to learn more about. Um, I also think there's so much information available online, but I know how many classes and things I've purchased and I just never get to, but you're here, you're now, you're learning, you're engaging. Like, you're going to go it's, sit It's one. now, yeah. And then, of course, the people. Like, I, I, I mean, I just hugged one of my best friends who I only see at events like this. And so it's it's like coming home. It's the social thing. That's what I yeah. love. I'm running into people I hadn't seen forever. So again, yeah. I appreciate your time so much. <laughs> no I know problem. you just got off stage. Yeah. Lindsay Adler, let me just tell you right up front, and I mentioned at the beginning that I've got three of her classes. If you don't go to Creative Live and check them out, <laughs> you're missing out because her content is really honestly that good. Uh, let's head around WPPI, see what else we can find. As I mentioned, one of the things I wanted to do this year at WPPI was some quote unquote man on the street interview. See what real average people attending the conference thought of the show. Here's the first one. All right, so we're here at WPPI and I'm stopping random people and this is? Uh, Jaden. Jaden, nice to meet you, nice buddy. To meet you. Appreciate it. So for me, WPPI is a social thing. For other people, WPPI is going to the classes, going to the workshops, the paid things, the, the photo walks, or watching people here on the expo floor. You told me off camera this is your second WPPI. I'm curious what you think of WPPI this year. Uh, well, this year I find it, um, it's a lot, they have a lot less things than last year, but I do uh, I do like, it's a lot or more spacious. So things like last year, I know one thing I am disappointed is last year they in the center, they had this full um, photo session. Yep. So you can like borrow gear and then do um, f photos and models and things like that. And it's all free, you just borrow it and then t try to get some awesome shots. Um, I do. I do think they took that out and then they expanded it to make more room for walkways. Maybe, it does seem to maybe. me like there's a few less vendors too. Like yeah. it's a little bit smaller, not a lot yeah. smaller. Did you sit in any classes? Uh, yes, I took a few on uh, Monday and Tuesday. Any that stuck out that you think the instructor needs, you gotta say, hey, this guy was great or this girl was great? Um, I took... Um, or these people were horrible? Either one. Uh, it was Jen, uh, Jen Rosenbaum. She okay. was really, really good uh, posing class. Very, she, she got through a lot of key points. Uh, her class is really real well Okay, perfect. Jaden, I appreciate it, man. All right. Enjoy WPPI 2020.
And boy. now one of the things I was looking most forward to at WPPI, let me give you some background. Back in August, I was at Photoshop World, and I met with the folks from Platypod. You've heard me probably mention Platypod before. I think it's one of the best engineered photography products on the market. If you haven't checked it out, make sure that you go to platypod.com url right here and uh, that will give you all the information on it i'm not sponsored by platypod let me make that clear this is not a paid ad i just happen to think the product is really well engineered well dr t larry from platypod has now invented another product it's called platyball you can go to platyball.com let's do this again it's right there right and that will take you to the kickstarter campaign and here's why this matters the kickstarter campaign ends march 15th that's three days after this video goes live, so you're running out of time. If you're watching this video, check your calendar, head to the Kickstarter campaign. Again, platyball.com will take you right to the Kickstarter campaign, and you can get in on it at the discount. Otherwise, you're going to have to buy it after the fact if you want one. And let me just say this. I don't want to spoil the interview, but as photography products go... This completely changes the way that you will think about a tripod head or what most people think of as a ball head. All right, so last time I was at WPPI, I had the pleasure of speaking with this gentleman because you've heard me say it on the show before, I absolutely love Platypod products. If you're not familiar with the Platypod itself, either the large one or the small one, you got to check them out. It's literally one of the best engineered products I've seen, but... I wanted to stop by and talk to Dr. T, Larry from uh, Platypod again, about this. So first of all, Larry, how are you? Okay, nice of you to come by, and uh, we'll talk about our products a little you've bit. Got some, you've got such amazing stuff. You and I have had Thank this you, conversation Steve. privately. Real quick, before we get into the ball head, for those that don't know Platypod, haven't seen one before, just give the helicopter view on what is a Platypod. Platypod's the world's most compact tripod. It's one that you can keep anywhere with you to get low angle photography, tabletop photography, just to have with you when you go on vacation because there's so many places that you go that won't allow tripods. This is a great way to avoid the tripod police. And our platypods will handle any tripod head that you can put on this. Plus, there's a special tripod head that you're going to want to hear about. Yeah, that's the thing. And by the way, these are actually one of the coolest things when you buy it, play with those, because they're really, honestly, really neat. Little so, spikes for rock the, and concrete. Yeah. For rock and concrete, but for leveling it, all kinds of stuff. So now let's talk about the, the elephant in the room. There is a Kickstarter going on for the Platypod ball head called the Platyball. And I had the privilege, because of you, back at Photoshop World 2019, to play with a prototype of this. And I've got to say... I don't know why this wasn't invented before. This is a one-handed ball head. Instead of holding your camera while turning a knob so your camera does, this is one-handed. Show us the ball head and explain it to us. All right, so first let's mount the ball head on. We've got a steel reinforced hole in here, which by the way, our base is carabiner friendly. You can see I've got a plat ball on here. Oh, I was wondering why carabiner. the holes. Okay. Yeah, that's why I've got the holes. Everything, everything that we do is, is carabiner friendly. So it's it's great for hikers and mountain climbers and all that. So first to mount it on, very, very simple, and you can tighten it on there real nicely. Then what we've done is we've gotten rid of all the knobs. You're no longer going to be fumbling for, for knobs over here because all the controls are right where your hands are going to fall. And you can't see it from the camera, but there's even a control under his thumb. I'll get I'll get around to that in, in one second, one second. So to unlock it, you pump our bottom button, you unlock. You pump the top button, it locks. And when you feel the tension in your fingers is getting nice and tight, you're ready to take your camera, mount your camera. Any ARCA compatible plate will work with the Platyball. You just slip that on top, you twist our little collar on here, and you're ready to shoot. If you untwist it like that, and we have a little safety on there to prevent it from untwisting accidentally, you'll be able to remove your camera. I'll keep that off just so you can see the functions very, very easily. To unlock the panning, your thumb will fall on this little wheel here. You pull it back a little bit, half an inch or so, and you can fluid pan very nice and just smoothly. Saying. Just feel that, Steve, how nice and easy that that and, goes and, back and, and forth. And it's smooth and easy, but it's not loose. Correct. Right? It's Correct. got a you little, get a little bit resistance. of, almost like a, like a fluid head. If you've ever played with a fluid head, that's kind of what that feels like. Correct. Now, see, so then you lock it like that. Now, one of the biggest problems we have with most ball heads is the little bubble level is usually obscured by either your camera 
or your lens Usually, or it's nighttime. Oh, it's always. I was being kind. Yeah. Okay. Now what we've done is we have what's going to be a new patented design with the world's first electronic leveling system. And to use this very, very simply, just going to unlock this again, is you just want to use it like an artificial horizon and when you get all four arrows in the center leveled, you are leveled and ready to shoot, just like that. So it's kind of like okay. what you would see on the back of an LCD screen of a camera when you pull a level up, but the advantage is, if you're doing live view, a lot of times you have to leave that to go bring up the level, and here, everything while your camera is mounted, one-handed, can see the level as you do it. It's Plus, if you're in the corner of a room, like many of our architectural photographers will put this on a shelf, your camera is facing this way, with many cameras, you can't see the monitor in the back right, anymore. Right. Mine just folds like this the very most, okay? That's on a Nikon D850, so you can't see that, but now you'll be able to level from the front uh, in, in this way very well. Now, for those who feel that they don't need that, we have a second model. Okay. Called a plat this is called a Platable Elite. This one's called the Platable Ergo. The only difference being this one doesn't have the electronic leveling. Otherwise, all the controls are the same. It's a one ounce weight difference. This is one pound five ounces. This is one pound six ounces. The function, all the mechanical functions are completely independent of the electronics. So if for any reason your battery goes out, everything here is modular. So the, electron the mechanical portion is completely independent. It'll still function perfectly. This is so you see what I'm saying. I don't know why this wasn't invented before, but this is why Larry exists. First the Platyball, first the Platypod in two sizes, and now the Platyball. And once that camera's on there again, it's tight. I can put it to where I can put this at an angle I want. If you don't want level, don't go level, right? You can put tension on it and not worry about your camera falling. Correct. And then very easily, you can just loosen it, put it where you want loose, tighten it again, all one-handed, no knobs. Right, and once once we're ready for full production, we're gonna have this rated to 22 pounds capacity. And what that means is, we're gonna test this, we're gonna actually hang about 35 pounds off of this sideways, come back five hours later, and it's gonna be right where you started when we're, when we're done. So, so it'll be a heavy duty unit. That's the Platyball. Uh, Kickstarter, where can they go? Good. To make it easy so you don't have to search for anything, just go to platyball.com, P-L-A-T-Y-B-A-L-L.com, and that will shoot you straight to our Kickstarter page. That's available till March 15th. After that, the price on this goes up $75 more uh, on March uh, 16th. And, so. and seriously, this is not a paid ad. I'm walking around here, I know Larry, I like Larry, and I love his products. I just think it's really, really cool. I think this will or has the potential to revolutionize ball heads. Uh, it's it's that neat, and you'll know what I mean once you play with it. So again, Larry, it is always good to see you, my Thank friend. You, I appreciate it. WPBI 2020, let's walk around and see what else we can find. Thanks a lot. It's time for the second interview with a Canon Explorer of Light. And this gentleman, when I looked at his website and read his About page, it had a word in it that intrigued me, and I wanted to ask him about it. All right, so I'm back here at the Canon booth, and I've got the legendary Joel Grimes with me. How are you? Well, we got the same haircut. I can see that Exactly. Right now. See? We've yeah. played buffet before. So <laughs> I'm actually really anxious to talk to you because I've followed you for a long time. I love your work, and there's one note that I saw on your bio on your website I've got to ask you about up front. Okay. You use the word, when you describe your own work, you say, I consider myself an illusionist. Yes. And I love that yes. because... That, to me, gets back in, I do magic as a hobby, and that gets also back into the artistic end of it. Describe to me how you see what you shoot. Well, okay, so if my goal was to, to capture reality, uh, you know, so if I take a picture of you, someone could say that's you. Right. But it's not reality, right? Right. So sure. it's, a rep at best, a representation of you. Right. So I say, even, a, even if I just took a, a okay average picture of you, it's kind of boring. So my job is to go beyond the average or the boring and to suck somebody into a world of make-believe. Okay. So I always say that if you had a magic show here in Vegas, 
to get to that level, how many hours a day do you think you practice to get there? Yeah, 20 years for for exactly. Nothing. Yeah, and that's how you. That's what you have to do to be a photographer. So you can't just get a degree in photography and think you're going to go and rock the world. Right. You got to practice your whole life. And I say at least six to whatever hours a day of doing the same thing over and over to get good enough to compete on the level of what you need to filter it in the marketplace. While I had Joel, I wanted to ask him the same question that I asked Lindsay Adler, and that is now that you're shooting the EOS R and have made the switch primarily to mirrorless, I wanted to know why as a working pro that was intriguing to them. And Joel actually had two main reasons. So the two reasons are, one is the, uh, the optics, okay? The optics are off the charts. So I'm an optic It's lenses freak. that have been designed by modern tools in the modern age. And because they don't have to worry about a mirror, they, it's, it's a uh, optical engineer's dream to create a lens for a mirrorless camera. For a single lens reflex camera, it's a nightmare. Right. So what that tells you is the parameters that they have to deal with now are the gloves are off. I mean, in terms of they're, they're, they're just having a lot of fun. So we're gonna get sharper lenses, um, new lenses that, um, for example, before were very difficult to create, are now no longer difficult. Uh, aberration is minimized. Right. Um, uh, like you wouldn't even believe it. Take a uh, 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 a standard lens that goes on our single reflex camera. Right. Shoot it wide open and look at the corners. They're soft. Yes. I've lived with that for uh, as long as I can remember. And, and you're not seeing that at all in the art. It's like unbelievable. It's a whole new world. Wow. So optics are one. The other is eye tracking. I can shoot. Uh, I got the new 85-1-2 DS, oh. okay? I'm shooting wide open like this, and my subject's doing this, and like that this. one, two. And boom, every single time. Right on the money. See, I want this. I want this really, really bad. So those are the two main reasons. When you're looking at the lens line that you do use, if you were stuck with one lens and one lens only to do everything that you would do, what would it be? That's a tough one. Um, my wife would love to have you, you know, hear that because I keep adding new lenses. Honey, right? we can sell them. Yeah. Um, well, so for general portraits, I'm always using the 24 to 70 to 8. Okay. They had the 24 to 105 f4, which was a absolutely beautiful lens, our lens. Oh yeah, it and was it's a great lens. range. I love the 24 to 105 just on range. It's f4. That's the thing. But it's sharp as can be. Well, they just came out with a 2470. I told my 2.8. I told my wife, I gotta have this. I have it now. It's my basic workhorse lens. Okay. I have the 15 to 35. I love that. Okay. And I have the 7200, 28, the new one. Right. It's a little short thing now. It's absolutely beautiful. It's razor sharp. And it's all those lenses are image stabilized. So I can, I don't do a lot of off, can't, off tripod. I shoot a lot on tripod. But it, they, they work incredible in that. Now this, the rumors, or the, the rumors, but this new R is going to yeah. have the, b the body built-in stabilization. The R5 that's rumored, in-body stabilization that pairs with in-lens yes. yes. stabilization. So it's going to be incredible. Oh, it would be amazing. Yeah. So, um, but I also have the 51-2. When the engineers, the optical engineers from Canon handed me that lens, they said, this could be the, the sharpest 50 ever ever designed. It's a big claim. And I, I, I just, my jaw hits the floor every time I see results from that. The 85, I'm, I'm looking at that now, I'm like, oh, it's incredible, right? So, um, yeah, we're in good times. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what is coming down the pike uh, in terms of the R side of things. Yeah. So, I'm a little kid in a candy store, but I can say this. If all I had was a Rebel that's right. five years old, what I started on with a Rebel 51 8, XTI, I could probably make incredible images. Right. So it really comes down to, you know, you work with what you have. Um, I always say you don't need a lot of lenses. Um, I get emails all the time. People say I only have one camera, one lens, whatever. But you don't need that much. You don't need that much. What is your one singular tip that you would say to them, do this and it'll set you on the right path? Okay, 
So I play music. I played the guitar. I was in a band when I could take and, and flip yeah. my hair back. You didn't need this even. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when it came to learn the guitar, I'm self-taught, right? Okay. Uh, and you learn a lot, right? But nothing takes the place of practice. So it really comes down to one thing. You just do and repeat the process more than your counterparts. So I said on stage just now that my strength isn't I'm a creative genius. I didn't come from a, you know, a dad who paid for everything. I, I had to scratch, claw my way to the top, so to speak. But the one thing I'm able to do is set a goal and work toward that. And I take and I practice something over and over again. It's, I was a gymnast also, and I used to remember I would get I'd get a certain trick, and I could accomplish it, but it wasn't smooth or very elegant. So with doing it a hundred times or a thousand times, it looked better the more I practiced. What did so, you What did really, you do in gymnastics? Well, you start out all around. Okay. But I ended up at the rings, high bar, and the parallel bars. But um, I, I was not as flexible as I should have been. Um, so floor X was very difficult for me. Because um, I wasn't flexible enough, but in the end, I, I really met, I, I I worked those three apparatuses. I have to say, meeting Lindsay Adler, meeting Joel Grimes, both just absolutely a huge part of my WPPI trip. And then there was meeting this next guy. As I was doing my man on the street interviews, I saw somebody in the distance. And if you're not familiar with the Petapixel podcast and Sharky James, you need to go introduce yourself to that podcast. He's got a new show out too called Sharky's Show. I've known Sharky over the internet for a number of years. We've never met in person until WPPI. So I've been doing this for a while now. I'm just looking around, asking people to stop by, and in the distance, I see none other than Petapixel's Sharky James. How are you, my friend? Great, how you doing? I'm we good. finally meet. We finally meet in person. We've known each other like so many of this <coughs> industry, right? Five years or so. Online friends, and finally he's in Vegas at WPBI, but you don't normally come to WPBI. I don't come to these things. I'm kind of low key. What made you come? Levi Sam made me come. The great Levi Sim. He lives in uh, in Boise, and we're good friends. We meet up a lot to eat out and have fun. And and he's like, "Come on, you got to get, you know." Everyone knows my story. I've had a lot of personal things happening with family lately and stuff, so it's been hard medically. And he's like, "You need to get, you need to change the scenery. You need to get, get out, out of town, town for a little bit, get to know your people, recharge the batteries. You'll be stronger for your family." And already, it's been worth it. Like. I didn't see the value of coming to these things before for me because I'm just a lowly podcaster. I'm not shooting weddings and all that. But I think everyone should come to these. At least come to the one in Vegas. Come on, the rooms are cheap. It's just, it's, it's, it's a no brainer. It really is. And the other thing about it to me is yes, there's classes. And I've sat through a couple of classes. And this year, they're actually some of the better classes I've seen at WPBI. But it's just the speakers around. And for me, it's this, yeah. right? Even if you don't know somebody, just walk up and say, hey, what do you shoot? Is that a Canon? Is that a Nikon? Are you a wedding photographer? Just say hi to people because it's that social game to me that is that recharge, right? You've already broken the ice. We've already got something in common because we love photography. Tell me about the Petapix's whole uh, podcast. I started it five years and three months ago. Paul Giroux, Sony Art is an imagery I've known for ever. I mean, talking about when I was a lot pounds lighter and 20 some years younger back in uh, Arizona, he was working for the Arizona Republic. I ended up, he figures heavily into my podcast. I ended up getting out of photography back there. I sold him my Canon 300 28. Wow. He was shooting for the Arizona Republic, like I said. I got completely out of photography. I went a different direction. Punched out of school. I was in the photojournalism program, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism there at Arizona State. Not known for its higher education. I somehow, I turned down Purdue for some reason. I was wow. going to design rockets, and I decided to go. Well, ASU was a lot warmer than when I, I was in a, Chicago. I went to ASU for a semester, yeah. Exactly. Go Devils, right? Hold, hold on. <laughs> are, are, is the level too high? We're good? Okay. We just want to check because it's, you know, it's live. Go ahead. And so I got out of photography altogether. Hadn't touched a serious camera in 14 years or so. Got back into it. My wife and I were out of town one day. I saw, um, I can't remember his name right now. You get here and you're like, I can't remember anybody's name. But I saw somebody online that we all know. He's one of the can explorers alike. And I saw Paul Giroux coming and I hadn't connected with him maybe in 15 plus years or so. I told him what I was gonna do. I was, gonna, I was seeking to take a position at uh, the Daily Herald over there in, in Utah where I was as a staff 
photojournalist, and he's like, listen, man, he's like, our bodies are already destroyed. I've got permanent nerve damage in both right. arms, neck, you know, pain, back pain, the whole thing, knees are shot. It's a young man's game. It's a dying industry anyhow for photojournalists. Punch out now, do this podcast idea that you have, see how it goes. And it just happened to be, it just took off and it's the most listened to photography podcast yeah, it's, in history, which is only 15 years of podcasting. It's First, number one on every chart that I see. It, it is, and it, it I, I, yeah, that's because of the listeners, you know? I mean, if they, if they weren't listening, I wouldn't have a show, right? So it was the first on Spotify and Pandora and all those kind of things, and that of course helped. But it's the listeners telling it's like others. A giant Velcro wall over it here. Is. It is. Like it's, it's hilarious. It's great. I want to like you know like put a Velcro suit on, jump against it, and then you can get me down. So tell them really quick, what do you do on the Petapixel podcast? What so that they know to go what they're going to get when they. So go. a lot of shows are what I call like two guys in the basement kind of shows. You can, you do one of those kind of shows, but you do it very well. You know, interview kind of shows, right. right? And I did one with Brian Matias for a while. We had a lot of fun. There was the No Name Photo Show. Uh, mine's fast paced, it's scripted, it's news based. You know, I was a journalist, right? It's my personality and somehow it just works. So combined, I've done 374 wow. episodes that I've written, recorded, edited, etc. And it's just, it's crazy. Where can so, they get it? Petapixel.com slash podcast. Wherever you listen to podcasts, I don't care where, just listen. Just type in Petapixel, P-E-T-A-P-I-X-E-L. You'll see the cartoon version of me, sans facial hair. Go ahead and check Subscribe, it out. I think you'll check enjoy it. Check it out. And Sharky, dude, Thank it is so, so much, nice brother. to meet it's you in person. Come to WPPI and these things. You meet people that you know online, and it's great. It helps strengthen your relationships. It's really what it's all about. And a lot of people are finding that missing piece here that's propelling them in their businesses and yeah, stuff. Yeah, sometimes it's so just a people. little spark, a little just reinvigoration type thing. All it takes is one little tip from somebody, and it's like, I hadn't thought of that before. Come on in, and Cannon people. Thank you very much. Kevin from Cannon. We got Scott from Cannon. They don't have mics. That's okay. They can talk loudly. Say hi, Kevin. Hi. Say hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. He says hi, Scott. He actually know, said hi, Scott. Anyway, behind the shot, WPPI, Sharky James. Let's go see what else we find. Check it out. Thanks, brother. Sharky, it was so wonderful to finally meet you live and in person. I hope you enjoyed WPPI. More importantly, I hope you had a wonderful, safe flight home and that the family is doing great. Next up on the interview side of this show, I went back to the Canon booth, and this next couple was both on stage at the Canon booth doing their own presentation, as well as being part of a panel. It's wedding photographers Bob and Don Davis. So I'm back here at the Canon booth, and I've got with me Bob and Don Davis. How are you guys doing? Good. We're doing great. Good, good. You Thanks. guys were just up on the stage a little while ago today. This is day two, three, whatever it is of WPPI. Yeah, seven. And I wanted to talk to you because as new gear comes out, one of the things I'm really excited about this year are some of the things that Canon has been doing. We've got the new 1DX Mark III. We've got the Canon R, and we have the announcement that I am just so excited about, the R5, that they won't let me touch. So you shoot both the 1DX Mark III and the R. And the EOS R. Well, it's so new, the 1DX Mark III. So previously, I was habitually 1DX Mark II and the EOS R. But I'm telling you, the 1DX Mark III can have its own designation. It's really more really? than just an iteration upgrade. Really? It's, it's that big of a jump to you? I believe so. Because they took what they learned for the R, with face and head and eye detection, they right. put this deep learning in. They've dramatically improved the autofocus and low light capability. So routinely with the 1DX Mark II, if we're at a wedding and event, slow light, I would go to one shot because it slows the focus down and lower light okay. with precision focusing. So Canon's invited me in to really push this camera hard and try it out. I'm now pretty much exclusively using it in AI servo in the ITR where it's selecting really? the array of focus points as long as I choose the activation point. Right, and then it goes from there to yes. track. The other thing is, I'm curious as a wedding shooter, and mostly Bob is the photographer and you're more the business side. Mm -hmm. Business it. designer. So I'm curious when you're shooting weddings, what's, what's your average ISO? Well, ISO these days is kind of irrelevant, but I will say because we light a lot, we use speed lights and off-camera okay. flash, they're a great tool where it allows me to add that sparkle. I'm never really above 2,000 ISO, so I hover between 800 and maybe 2,500. And the only reason I might change the ISO to go higher is the amount of ambient light I want to draw in. 
So that too will allow me to use all the light or negate the light. Right, right. To to really you focus on the flash or to more Blend of it. a fill flash type thing. Let's go to the business side of things. From a one of the things I always see with wedding photographers, so many wedding photographers come into this industry and fail. Or struggle, let's put it that way. And I think a lot of it is People, whatever the business industry is, people tend to open a business for, for services or products that they know, but they aren't business people. What's the biggest mistake that you see wedding photographer businesses make? Trying to compare themselves to other photographers, trying to compete with other photographers. I think once you grasp that it's an emotional industry that we work in, especially weddings, right, right. Every, every decision that especially a bride makes, Every decision a bride makes, every decision a bride, mother of the bride makes, is based on emotion. And so the only thing that you have different between the other photographer down the street is you. So if you can That's build a, a really relationship or a connection yeah. with that bride, and you're just a little bit more money, and they, you had an hour-long meeting and they, you fell in love with each other, chances are they're going to pick you because they trust you. You're not just a name. You're not just a number anymore, you know? It's not. It's not the website is the, the business card. But yeah. the conversation is really... It's all about relationships. Yeah. And yeah. one of my pet peeves, actually, is good communication is actually hard, is actually easier than, than bad communication. Sure. But so many people are bad you know, at communication think, in business. I think what's most important is when you're communicating, you're communicating the real you, not the one you think your clients want to see or hear. Because like attracts like, and if you want to work with people that are like-minded, you have to be who you are authentically. And for you as the photographer side of things, that's the same thing. Communication it with that client. Huge. When when do you, as you're shooting with people, when do you go choose the R, the EOS R, over the 1DX Mark III? Well, they're great tools, and just think of it as that. So the 1DX Mark III, while it's a great camera, it's still a digital SLR. There are times where I want to be subtle. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't want to have off-camera flash. It right. may be a sensitive moment. I love that we can now have true silent mode. But then I love also photographing wide open at times, large apertures, like the 28 to 70 aperture too. With mirrorless, it's not focusing twice. It doesn't struggle in low light it, because you're always It doesn't focusing. focus to the viewfinder off the mirror. Right. Yes. And then, okay. What I mean by twice is with a traditional digital SLR, the light comes in. Sorry. Yes, I, no, it does. I've heard explain this a thousand times. It goes times. through the viewfinder so we could see that it's in focus. Yeah. And then the mirror lifts up and it actually micro focus adjusts back to the image sensor. Okay. And that's where we get into challenges, low light, low contrast, where you don't get consistency. And wide focus aperture. And wide aperture. With the EOS R, it's actually breathed new life into old lenses. So I have an ancient a Canon 200 1.8. Heavy, big, gorgeous piece of glass. But my 1DX Mark II, they won't even calibrate it anymore because it's out of life, end of life, but it's a great piece of glass. In order for me to get frame to frame consistent sharpness and not worry, I need to be around 3.5 for okay. the aperture. Then I might as well use my 70 to 200 and sacrifice the weight of this big right. lens. I want to use that 1.8 or 2. With the EOS R, that was the first thing I did is I brought that lens out and I said, I'm going to really see how good mirrorless is. And boom, every frame at one eight? I took at 1.8. And with the eye and face detect, it locks. See, I this found, is why this is why I'm not a mirrorless shooter yet, and I want to be a mirrorless shooter really bad. This actually is an interesting thing with the 1.8. I'm kind of curious. You're a wedding photographer. That's your business, and you've been doing that for quite a long time, which is why you speak here at Canon. You're also transitioning, though, and you're doing other things. So you're doing safaris in Africa and things like that. Yes. What's your chosen body for that type of shooting? Well, it depends, again, on what I'm photographing. Okay. So the EOS R has a much larger file. And well, I can't say more dynamic range anymore, but with the 1DX Mark II and our last trip to Africa, it had more dynamic range. So if I was doing stellar night photography, here's another plus. With your traditional DSLR, and I've yet to not test this on the 1DX Mark III, but on the EOS R, you could see the stars in the EVF oh. to actually zoom in, right. focus, precise. Where with your traditional camera, it's a guess. Even if you're in live view, something has changed in the live view, like I can't see the stars. So I have to focus earlier in the day, lock down the camera, lock down my composition, and then photograph once the stars come out. You know, sorry, we don't have to do that. You could actually pinpoint a star, focus, lock it, done. It's huge. You guys with the Africa stuff are doing you know, tours and workshops now. 
where will people be able to find those? Uh, they're not started yet. You've done some. Yeah, so but... we're in the midst of planning our next one. Okay. But davisworkshops.com would be the place that it would be. Say that one more time. Davisworkshops.com. Okay, davisworkshops.com. Okay. Would we'll be the place that we'll post it. On Facebook? Yep, and on Facebook, primarily Facebook. They, okay. Facebook's where we usually promote everything. And what's the Facebook page? It's Bob and Don Davis. Bob and Don Davis. Bob and Don if you Davis. Google them, you're going to find them. I yeah. Mean, they speak at Canon. They're, they're out there, trust me. So one last question for you is actually two last questions. As long as we're talking about URLs, what's the actual website? BobandDonDavis.com. BobandDonDavis.com, yeah. okay. And then what is your, as a photographer, somebody out there is thinking, I want to go shoot in Kenya. Sure. I want to shoot a safari, but I don't want to go out there and feel like I'm starting from scratch and I don't know what I'm doing. Or I'm going to go shoot a wedding. What's the one tip you give a young photographer that will get them going quicker? The one tip that like I, the can't leg stress, up, as it were. I can't stress enough is... So many people practice on the She just said event. the same thing. Yep. Yeah. They do. If it's in, so when we take people to Africa, we start a group about a month ahead of time on Facebook, and I'll start giving people homework. I want you to practice. Ooh, look I like at the that. birds. I like look that. at a squirrel. Because it's erratic in its movement. Right. I don't want you to get to Africa. You're going to be so excited the first time you see an animal in its environment that you're not going to be getting photographs that you have this experience for. Same way with the wedding. Practice on friends. Practice capturing moments. Then when you go to the event, you're familiar with your gear. You're familiar with what you want to create. And then the gear gets out of the way and allows that vision to come through. We'll get, we'll get people that come to our workshop and then not practice, get to a wedding and call him yeah. during the wedding and kidding. say, I can't get the triangle of the lights. And he's like, put it, did you practice? No, I put it away. You're missing the moments. Put it away. Get home. Practice. Call me tomorrow. Right. You yeah. Know? So practice, practice, practice. There's an old saying it takes 10,000 hours to perfect something. So go find 10,000 hours and perfect I still craft. practice. Every Gotta day. Gotta be green and growing. Yeah. And that's actually, a, that's actually an excellent point. There is no point yeah. where somebody that's an artist, that's a creative, right. ever reaches right. you know, the top. There's plateaus. Sure. Never at the top. You can always improve. Always. So Bob and Don Davis, thank you for stopping by. You thank were about you. to say something. No, right? just always be green and growing. Always be green and growing because if you're not, you're like you always say, ripe on the you're vine, dying. Ripe on dying. the vine and dying. Seriously, I, wanna, I mean, you... I don't want to be dying. Okay, you got to write a book of these. <laughs> so Bob and Don Davis, Google them, look them up, Bob uh, and Don Davis dot com. Yep. And so check that out. Check out their Facebook page if you want to find out about their their workshops that they're going to do to Africa. To both of you, thank you for stopping thank by. Thank you for having us. WPPI 2020. We're walking Woo-hoo! around finding people. We're almost nearing the end of the show, but I have two more Man on the Street interviews I wanted to share with you. One of them was a nice surprise because it's an ex-guest of Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, welcome to WPPI. I'm Steve Brazel, and this time around, I'm walking around WPPI, and I run into my buddy Brett Stanley. He's been on the show before, underwater portrait photographer. How are you? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. So what do you got going on nowadays? Uh, At the moment, I'm building underwater sets, so I'm building entire rooms in my pool studio in Long Beach. Actual rooms underwater? Yeah, three walls, a floor, putting furniture and stuff in there, and, and just shooting my clients in these incredible, surreal underwater environments. So... Tell me a little bit about what WPPI does for somebody for like what you shoot. Uh, it's uh, it's a little bit different for me because a lot of the gear here is not really targeted at me. Um, but walking around, there are little bits and pieces that, that fit into my kind of gear structure. Um, but WPPI is pretty much a, uh, a place for me to, to meet all my fellow photographers. Right, it's the social. See, and that's what it is for me. It's the social thing of running into people like you. Where can people find Brett Stanley? Uh, I'm at brettstanley.com. Okay, so that makes yeah. it easy. And again, make sure you go back. I'll try and put a, a link in the show notes. Uh, back at the episode I did with Brett with one of his underwater photos that's absolutely awesome. But check him out at his website, brettstanley.com, WPPI 2020. Let's keep walking. All right, so again, we're just doing that stop people and ask them if they're willing to talk. And once we get past the odd looks, some people say yes, as this young lady did. What's your name? Uh, Paro. And where are you from? I am from Orange County, California. Ca- California, okay. Yes. And you're a photographer. What do you photograph? I photograph mostly portraits in nature. That's so, my excuse to get away. Yeah. Well, you know what, though? I believe you can learn. Your portraits can improve from shooting nature. Right? Yeah. Anything you learn can improve whatever you normally shoot. What's your website? Do you have one? Yes, I do. It's amparobarajasymmetry.com. Okay. And 
what I really want to know is, I'm always curious, I've been to WPBI so many years, and some years it's bigger, and some years it seems to be smaller, and some years people like the classes, and some years people don't. I'm kind of curious what you think of WPBI this year, and is it your first time? Well, this is my first time here, and it's definitely overwhelming. It, there's a lot to see. There's. Um, I wish I came here with more time. It was a very last minute trip. Um, have you sat through any of the classes? No, I just walked around. Walk, the, walked around and then yes. the, the expo floor here. Yes, I especially with um, like uh, the booths that have like printing uh, materials. Right. Yes. So I what I think I visited all the booths that has the different albums and see what kind of products they they have so that I can um, be more informed. Has it left an impression on you that you would come back again? Oh yes, definitely. Okay. So overall, you're happy with it? Yes, I'm very satisfied. Um, it opened a whole other world oh, yeah. that I didn't know was out there. And some of my favorite thing is just walking around the X. I've spent. WPBIs, not in any classes, other than maybe sitting in one to see how it is. Uh -huh. Mainly just walking around the expo floor because every booth, every major company, Canon, Nikon, whatever, yes. they all have speakers. And some of those speakers that speak for, you know, 40 minutes mm -hmm. instead of an hour and a half class. Yes. It's amazing content. I mean, you can, Peter Hurley's doing a headshot mm -hmm. session behind us here, which is amazing. Um, we've had, t Lindsay Adler was doing a posing thing yesterday. Oh, okay. So there's just great stuff around here. But anyway, I'm glad that you came to WPPI. I'm glad that you are, are enjoying it. One more time, give your uh, address, your, your website. It's www.amparobarajasimentry.com. Okay. And for those that don't speak Spanish well, you want to spell it? Ooh, yes. It's... It's long. Yeah, it's very long. So. Oh, there we go. We got it on the name here. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, it's my name, imagery.com. Okay, yes. perfect. Yes. Look her up. Give her some love for stopping by. <laughs> Behind the shot, WPPI 2020. Thanks for stopping by. We're going to keep walking around and see what we find. Okay. Thank well, you. thank you. We have time for one more interview before we close out the show. As I was chatting earlier with Lindsay and Joel and Bob and Don, we mostly discussed the EOS R and the new 1DX Mark III. Little bit about their most recent announcement from Canon. So I thought, why not head back, talk to my buddy Drew at Canon, get a little bit more technical detail on the R, the 1DX Mark III, and yes, the new Canon R5 announcement. So I've done a number of interviews here at the Canon booth with a number of Canon explorers of light and people that have been up on the stage here at Canon sharing their knowledge and sharing the, the educational skills that they have. But I wanted to come back to Canon one more time to speak with my friend Drew McCallum. I've spoken with Drew before. We talked, yes, we uh, I think it was when the EOS M5 or something came out. Oh, well, it was, I yeah. mean, it was a while ago. It was a number of years ago. And Canon, as you've seen through the interviews, Canon's got a number of new bodies out and some announcements that they've made, and I want to talk about those with somebody who really knows the product. First of all, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, welcome to WPBI. Welcome to Vegas. This is the camera that I want so bad, and that's something I need to ask about. So <laughs> this is a 1DX Mark III from Canon. Right. When somebody is looking at Canon gear, like I shoot a 5D Mark IV, I shoot a 5D Mark III. Right. When somebody's looking at a body like this, what's, what is the demographic you're going at? Oh wow, that, that's one of those questions that everybody assumes that this camera is instantly for your NFL, your sports, right. your, your baseball sidelines. The, yes, it has its home there, and it is very, very at home on the sidelines of major sporting events and uh, fast action in, in the you know, birding and nature, but we've oh, got- birding, I like yeah, that one. Yeah, that's right? a good idea. Yeah, so, okay. cause you're, you mean, you're running 16 frames a second, you have from wing flap to wing flap, you know, different variations of how the bird flies, whatever, uh, whatever those nuances of You're gonna get the shot. Life, you're gonna get the shot. Right. But we also have a lot of EOLs and other end photographers that are using a body like this for wedding, for portrait, for event photography, because it is, it's, it's, it's just beat the snot out of it's, it. Yeah, right? yeah, it's you, a workhorse. It's a workhorse. Um, See, battery here's life. what intrigues yep. me about this, doing what I do, which is live music. Right. Oh, yeah. The virtually unlimited buffer, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's an insane buffer. It's an insane frames per second, all at a performance level, ISO-wise, high ISO-wise, right. that would make most cameras cry. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're comfortable shooting at 6400 in, in a concert venue, right. which is fairly normal, I mean, you can crank this thing up another stop higher, and I have no problem taking this to 102,000. Wait a minute. Say that again? 102,000. And you'd be comfortable shooting it? I'd be that. comfortable shooting it. Now, it depends on your publication, where you're going, what you're right. doing. 12.8, not a problem whatsoever. None. Uh, so I could shoot a body like this at 12.8, yeah. 12,800 ISO. Yes. And it'd be a usable image. It'd be a very usable image. I, You're able to get I'm stuff. I'm looking at my yeah. wife. I'm about to say to her, I forgot I was on camera. I was about to say, honey, I'm about to buy a camera. <laughs> So what is that? So this is a WFT E9. This is a Wi-Fi transmitter that takes oh, okay. extended range. So the camera, the 1DX Smart 3 is the first 1D series to have a built-in Wi-Fi capability. It's a magnesium alloy chassis. There's a lot of electronics, and this thing is tightly, tightly packed. That internal Wi-Fi is great for quick, easy stuff to your phone, whatever. But if you're doing high-end work, if we're on a stage like this, and we need to transmit to a server that's Right. significant distance away, this is a five gigahertz band also, but okay. this gives me longer reach. And since it's outside the body, right. I can get- Without the interference, much, without yep. the magnesium in the way. Right. What else in this body should people be thinking about? Well, there's a few things that, if, and maybe not in the concert realm, but maybe if you're in news, journalism, and you need to go into a venue, okay. even in weddings, where you need to be completely silent, you can kick the camera into live view, enable the electronic silent shutter and you will not hear a thing and you're shooting at 20 frames per second with autofocus tracking. Instead of 16. Instead of 16. So you actually get quiet and, and more frames more, yeah. per second. Okay. So with the 1DX being the body, right, the high-end body, let's talk about the EOS R a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the EOS R being the mirrorless body that's out now and then there's the, the, the announced R5. Correct. What's the demographic for that R? Well, we have the R, and they also have the RP, which is the entry-level right. mirrorless full frame. The R, um, it is a 5D Mark IV sensor. So image quality-wise, you're getting that same image quality that you know from the 5D IV. The image, the, the, the body itself, there's a lot of requests for dual card slots and uh, faster frame rates, things like that, that apply to a pro. So the R, again, we launched two years ago, 2018. Has it been that long? It's been almost two years wow, now, okay. almost. So the R fits a lot. If you look around here at WPPI, you're going to see a lot of R's. I have, actually, yeah. And a lot of people are using them as a sideline to their 5D4. You know, their second camera, their mirrorless, their quiet, their silent camera that they want to use. Something that's lighter weight and easier to carry. Um, so it fits a lot of different demographics from the advanced amateur to the pro. And that's where the development well, of the R5 comes. Well, it's got the video side, too. I have a friend oh, yeah. who's the tour photographer for Eric Church. Right. He uses a 1DX Mark II yeah. for stills. Right. He uses the R for stills too, but all the Eric Church video stuff that they produce right. is on his EOS R. Right. Uh, you know, he puts it on a gimbal, a, a Ronin, and he loves the thing. I mean, he swears by it. So now let's talk about the, the announced, no longer rumored, the right. R5, which my, my Twitter feed lit up when it turned from rumor to, oh, Canon announced the R5. With everybody going, that's the one. That's what I've been waiting for. That's what I want. Oh, I hope the price point's right. Oh, I hope, I mean. There's a was, lot of wants and needs and. Uh, and and I, my answers were, yeah, me too, yeah, me too, me, yeah, me too. So on the R5, as far as what we do know, right? what do we have? So we, we've put out a development announcement on the R5, which means it's in the works. Right. It's not officially, you know, a, a full release yet. But it so physically exists. It physically exists. There's one in the case right over there under glass. Unfortunately, it's the only one in the country right now. I would, uh, so we know, and we've put out there that we will have 8K video. Right. We have put out there that it will have two card slots. What those are? Which is, right, we don't know what they we are yet, but it yet. just the fact that there's two, there's two is a huge thing for a lot of pros. Biggest demand from the pro market was I need two card slots, I need to have a backup, I need to have a relay of some sort I, that need to happen. Right. So, of course, there, there's two. Um, they, we, we have stated that it is 12 frames mechanical shutter, 20 frames per second electronic. So it's got some speed to it. Right. Um, it's got pro specs all the way around from the video side. Right. And even I sat back when I saw the 8K and said, you know, nobody that I know, th there's nothing really even to consume 8K on. But if you're 
editing in 4K and you want to be able to crop and zoom the video, or even in my case, if you're doing 1080 yeah. and you've got 8K video source, the stuff that you can do with zooming in, zooming out with that one footage is well, insane. If you watch the electronic shows and things like that, uh, the, the big trade shows that are based around electronics, 8K was the conversation. Every TV yeah. I saw was 8K. And while there's very little 8K content right now, they were showing amazing 4K that was on these 8K monitors or TVs. Um, so 8K is not that far away from the production realm. Um, you know, we've got the C500s and, and other cinema bodies, right. so they're moving towards higher frame rates and higher resolutions. We're doing 5.5K in the 1DX Mark III, so that's bumping up, so it's not far away. And what I like is the, the breadth that you're covering. You mentioned the C500. There's a lot of YouTubers out there right now that are just raving about using a C200 oh, yeah. for a YouTube oh, product. Yeah. Um, Renee Ritchie of iMore uses one, a bunch of other high-end YouTubers, higher-end than me. But getting back to the still stuff yes, sir. here at WPPI, this is part of the reason that you come to this type of a show at WPPI is it's not just when you come to this type of an expo, it's not just you walk by and you see something and keep walking. You can see here behind me, they have experts at the booth and every manufacturer does yeah. that, right? You've got whatever you're shooting, you can stop by and you can talk to an expert about it. And what I love about the Canon people as a Canon shooter is you walk up here, these people are amazingly trained to answer whatever question you have, and trust me, if they don't know the answer, which is rare, they'll say, hang on, and they'll find you the answer. It's a great resource, plus you get to see things like the R5 that's in the glass over here that <laughs> my mind is gonna keep going back to. So let's talk about a couple of last things here. Sure. First of all, price-wise. What is the retail price on a 1DX Mark III? Uh, $6499. Okay, so it's $6,500. 6, okay, and what about the EOS R? EOS R, there's uh, several promos going on right now, so I would actually have to look that one up because that's been changing quite a bit I've right seen now. It low, it's a I great can... deal right now. Yeah, there's I've a seen lot it less of promos. Than two. It, yeah, it, it's. I think I've seen it like seventeen ninety nine, if I'm not mistaken. Which, I, I could... which for getting into mirrorless, if you're a Canon shooter and you've already got a bunch of EF glass and you don't want to buy new glass, that's the way to get into mirrorless, really. So. Uh, and you get all of those great video features and, and still features. So Drew, as always, I appreciate. Is there anything I didn't ask you that Canon? wants to say? Uh, wow, that's such a, a, a great it's question, a, but it's, a, it's, always, yeah. it's always one of those. No, we um, we are always happy to be here and, and commit and, and support our professional photographers. They they are a lifeblood of us, so we, we are here for them. We, we love coming to answer their questions and get their feedback because that comes to me to help develop the next products that are coming out. Well, and while we're on it, and you've heard me say this before on the show, but the Explorers of Light program is something I'm a huge fan of. I've had over 10, probably, Explorers of Light on my podcast. And everyone, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard to schedule them. They're busy. But they're all willing to give back and do it. And that's one of the things I just truly love about Canon is that Explorers of Light program, getting out there and, and educating people and sharing knowledge freely. I, I just... As a fan of photography, right. that's one of the best things I think Canon does is give back to the community with that type of a resource for photographers. So thanks for that. But again, as always, thank you for this conversation. Thanks for, for the sure. booth. I just shot with one of those not long ago. <laughs> that was so much fun. I'll tell you, handheld, your elbow hurts when you're done. Get a monopod for it. So we're here at the Canon booth, WPPI. When you see this, WPPI will be over. But there are photo shows around the country, Photo Expo Plus, Imaging US, all of these photo shows, whatever photo show you go to, bring your gear down. Canon, for example, has a room. You can get free cleaning, stuff like that. Utilize those resources and meet people. The social game is fantastic. So to Drew, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks for having and me. And to everybody else, we're going to head around WPPI, see what else we can find. And that almost wraps up a look back at WPPI 2020 Mandalay Bay, Las Vegas. But before I leave, a couple of quick notes. First of all, I want to thank Peter Reed Miller. Peter was a recent guest on the show. And at WPPI, I was able to not only meet Peter, but help him with an interview that he did. And it's a highlight of my life to meet a sports photography legend like Peter. So, Peter, thank you very much. It was wonderful to meet you. Scott Heath, I need to say a big thank you to Scott. Scott's response 
responsible for a lot of the interviews that I do on the show, specifically Canon Explorers of Light. He works with Canon, and at the WPPI show, all four of the interviews that I did at the Canon booth with Explorers of Light and Canon personnel, those are all because of Scott. So Scott, thank you very, very much for that. And speaking of Canon Explorers of Light, I do want to take a moment to say thank you very, very much to Joel Grimes and Lindsay Adler. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And as well, Bob and Don Davis, thank you so much for coming on the show. And keep in mind, you can watch out for their African safari workshops that they're doing. You can check out all the information that we gave out during the show. Speaking as well of Canon, Drew and Kevin from Canon. Thank you for your help, Drew, for the interview. Platypod, Larry, it is always wonderful to see you, sir. Congratulations on the Kickstarter campaign, and I wish you the best in your new product release. The Man on the Street interviews. Sharky James, dude, awesome to meet you in person. Also, Amparo, got to say thanks to you. Jaden, thank you to you. Good to see Brett Stanley again, former guest on the show. And as I was filming in Las Vegas, something interesting happened. As I'm doing recordings, literally as I'm recording, I'd look over at my portable system and see people coming up and inspecting it. So if you are interested in the system that I use to record most of this, which I did have some issues with this time around, uh, make sure that you head to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash behind the shot. I am going to put up and subscribe there. I'm going to put up a separate video that I did while I was at WPPI that is just a walkthrough of my system. That wraps up this episode of Behind the Shot, a special episode. Normally what we do is have a guest on and try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. I'm Steve Brazel. We'll see you on the next show. 